past two Sunday mornings, we have looked at Eli and the judgment that God places upon him, as recorded in 1 Samuel, the third chapter, verses 11 through verse 13. It says, And the Lord said to Samuel, Behold, I will do a thing in, at, in Israel, at the which both the ears of every one that heareth it shall tingle. And that day I will perform against Eli all things that I have spoken concerning the house, uh, concerning his house, when I began. I will also make an end. <clears throat> For I have told him um, that I will judge his house forever for the iniquity which he knoweth, because his sons made themselves vows, and he restrained them not. Even though Eli was not an ungodly man, instead he was actually a very pious man, he was an aged priest, he had judged Israel for, uh, for 40 years, and as a judge he would hear God's word, and deliver messages from God to the people. Outwardly, there was no evil in his life, at least nothing that is recorded for us. He, even though he was old in years, at this point in time, he had a youthful heart as you see the relationship between the young man Samuel and Eli. He was generous. For long years he had been a priest, and yet here he sees now this young man Samuel, who was going to be taking his place. He did not begrudge him, he did not rebel, he didn't grow bitter against the situation, didn't give place to envy and strife. Didn't start saying hard things about Samuel. But instead, he helped Samuel and trained Samuel. Uh, so, he seems from all outward appearances to be a very godly person. But yet God has set forth a judgment upon him. So we ask the question, why was such judgment pronounced not only upon or against Eli's house, but also against Eli himself? What was wrong with him? Well, the answer is in that text that we read. He was guilty by what he failed to do. He was not guilty himself of sin that we know of, but his sons were. His sons made themselves vile, Hophni and Phinehas, and he restrained them not. Their sins were not hidden from Eli. He knew about them. He even rebuked them, but it was a very mild rebuke. Basically, you shouldn't be doing these things. He failed to restrain them, though, and thus Eli was going to share in their guilt and their doom. We ask the question, then, why did Eli fail to restrain them? Some have claimed that, well, he, might, he just probably loved them too much to do that. Uh, and yet, in reality, it, was, it becomes just the opposite, and we'll look at that more this morning. Some thought that he was simply too busy. You ever seen someone who is so busy doing something or saying something, and their kids are just running around and they're just totally oblivious to it. And some thought, well, maybe Eli was like that. He was simply so busy that he didn't really attend to, uh, to it. But that's not the case in the very fact that he gave them mild rebuke in 1 Samuel 2, verses 22 through 25. But it was far too mild of a way in dealing with such actions as, 
as his sons were involved in. They should have immediately been removed from the priesthood, but they weren't. The text or the scriptures show that they were sons of Belial. And as such, the law of Moses required that you immediately take them out and stone them. Deuteronomy 17, verses 3 through 5. Didn't happen. They were rebellious children, and the scriptures again state what is to be done with rebellious children. Deuteronomy 21, verses 18 through 21, and that is the parents were to take those rebellious children to the elders, and then they would be taken out and stoned. None of that was, was done in this case. He gave them a very mild rebuke. You shouldn't be doing this. But it was way too soft, way too easy, to, way too weak need in dealing with such sins that his sons were involved in. He loved them, no doubt, but he did not love them enough to restrain them. And thus, it says that the Lord's not only going to punish his children, he's going to punish the house of Eli and Eli himself. And thus we began looking at, and want to continue this morning, the sin of pious softness. It's not a Christ-like attitude pious softness. The Lord always stood for light, but sometimes it took bold actions. For example, at the beginning of his ministry, John the second chapter, and then again at the end of his ministry in Matthew the 21st chapter, you see Jesus going into the temple, and while it says, zeal of mine house has eaten me up, he sees the money changers there. He turns over the, their tables. He drives out the animals. <clears throat> he didn't just go in and say, you know, y'all shouldn't be doing this, and then just turn right around and walk out. That would have been the attitude of Eli. Instead, he took action. He always strongly rebuked those individuals who were in sin calling them to come out of the sin. It's never, he was never guilty of pious softness as Eli was. <clears throat> but we see today the failure of pious softness in the home. Parents are given the responsibility, a, the obligation to train up their children to raise their children. Sadly, we've pawned off in our society the raising of children to daycare centers and to the schools. As I remember in listening to one teacher at a school tell, speaking to parents, we want you to help us raise your children. And they place the responsibility on them, the school, when in reality the responsibility was the parents. Paul would state in Ephesians 6 and verse 4, <clears throat> You fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. He places the main responsibility upon the fathers. They are to bring up their children. They are to be the ones who are training them teaching them in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. <clears throat> in Titus, the second chapter, is, it says in verses <coughs> 4 and verse 5, concerning the older women, that they are to teach the younger women to be sober, to love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet, chaste, keepers at home, good, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God be not blasphemed. 
to the loving of their children, the keepers at home, all of that is embraced in the teaching and the training of those who are their children. Bringing them up. Teaching them what is right. Training them. Because bringing them to maturity does involve training. <clears throat> and Deuteronomy, the sixth chapter. <coughs> God would tell the Israelites through Moses, and thou shalt teach them diligently. How about the children? Thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children, and talk of them while thou sittest in thine house, and when thou walkest by the way, and when thou liest down, and when thou risest up. Parents, teach these things and these principles to your children so that they will know them. Uh, at one time, we saw that taking place in America. Today, we don't see that happening. I was rebuked in a, by a, one who was an older preacher's wife at the time when I was saying that parents need to have daily Bible study with their children. An older preacher's wife rebuked me for saying that, for teaching that. And the excuse, well, we're too busy today. The sin of pious softness in failing to teach your children. You can expect them, require them to, yes, sit down and have a study of the Bible together. Well, we go here and there, and we never have time to hardly see each other, much less parents having the time to, and taking the time to teach their children. In Deuteronomy, the 32nd chapter, in verse 46, he again says, And he said unto them, Set your hearts upon, unto all the words which I testify among you this day, which you shall command your children to observe, to do, all the words of this law. You parents command your children to observe to do all the words of this law. That kind of puts it upon the parents' responsibility. That they had, now yes, that's dealing with the law of Moses, but the principle is the same in relationship to the law of Christ. Parents have that responsibility, that obligation to command their children to observe, to do all that God says in the New Testament, to live according to the New Testament, to be living and to adhere to that which God wants us to live and adhere to. But there also comes time in which there's the need to restrain the children as well. The wise man Solomon, and he's writing by inspiration of God, has much to say along this line. For example, in Proverbs 3 and verse 12, For whom the Lord loveth, he, cor he correcteth, even as a father, the son in whom he delighteth. A parent, a father in particular, is to correct that son when he goes astray. In the 13th chapter, he again says, He that spareth his rod hateth his son, but he that loveth, loveth him chasteneth him the times. And that word betimes variously defined immediately sometimes or appropriately right then as needed we're told today though and we went back going back to that time of Dr. Spock and his psychology 
that our society started going by. You don't discipline a child, basically. You let them do what they want to do. You let them express themselves. Never tell them no. <laughs> Never spank them. I mean, that was totally out of line. And yet, Solomon says, the one who spares the rod hates his son. You can state how much you love them, tell them how much you love them, but when you fail to restrain them properly, then it shows a real hatred for them. Again, in the 29th chapter of Proverbs, <clears throat> He would state in verse 15 that the rod and reproof giveth wisdom, but a child left to himself bringeth his mother to shame. Then a couple of verses later in verse 17, he would again state, Correct thy son, and he shall give thee rest. Yea, he shall give delight unto thy soul. In other words, you properly correct a child and the end result is going to be rest. In other words, you're not going to have to worry about him. When you fail to correct him, then as he grows and develops, without that correction that has been given, you're going to be worrying about him because he's out of control then. He's going to be doing things that he should not be doing. And such, correct him in the proper time and early, and then you don't have to worry about him. Parents must not give way to permissiveness. Far too many children have grown up and are growing up without any boundary lines for their actions. And what a child does many times and generally is that a child desires boundaries. And when no boundaries are given, they go a little bit farther over trying to get a boundary, trying to get their parents, tell me to stop. And they don't tell them to stop, and so they go a little bit farther, and they keep going over, and they keep getting out in trouble and farther into trouble. Why? Because the boundaries were never set. And thus, there's no consequences for their actions until generally the government has to come, step in and take action in regards to their children. Why? Because the parents failed to set the boundaries. Or sometimes they'll set the boundaries, but they don't really mean it. And the child knows they don't mean it. And so if the child will, even when young, they learn real quick. The parent says no, but they don't mean it, so they yell and scream and throw their little temper tantrum until the parent just, well, here, take it. And they've then learned, you know, if I want something, all I have to do is cause enough ruckus and I'll get it. And then the parents generally, in exasperation, says, I can't do anything with that child. That's because you've taught him to act that way. You failed to restrain him. So many times uh, we see children acting up and those around kind of roll their eyes sometimes and even will many times express, well, he needs the Board of Education applied at the seat of learning. And they'd correct a lot of that nonsense. The parent will say no, though, and just give in. Permissive parents then produce per permissive children. And permissiveness 
its ultimate goal will destroy everything. Parents need to learn to be parents, to teach and to train. A lot of times some parents think the only teaching and training, uh, that's out the door. In reality, all they want to do is whip their children. And there's no love shown, there's no care, no concern, no teaching that is involved in it. And that's just as damaging to a child as failing to, to properly chastise them. And we have both extremes today. The parents need to teach their children, but they also need to restrain their children, done in a loving, caring way. But not only do we see the failure in the home, there's failure in society as well. Crime has become a greater and greater problem in society. And one of the reasons is because of pious softness. Scriptures clearly teach us about government and the role of government. In Romans 13 and verse 1, Paul would write, Let every soul be subject unto the higher powers, for there is no power of God, and the powers, or the powers that be are ordained of God. And thus governments are ordained by God. In 1 Peter 2 and verse 13, Peter would emphasize the same thing when he says, Submit yourselves to every ordinance of man. For the Lord's sake, whether it be to the king <coughs> as supreme, and he goes on with the same thoughts. Submit yourselves to them. Why? Because they are ordained of God. The government, being ordained of God, has a responsibility in governing. It has the duty of keeping order. Again, in 1 Peter 2, verse 13 and 14, submit yourselves. We read that just a moment ago. <coughs> he goes on uh, to, every, well, to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake, whether and to the king, to be to the king as supreme or to governors, or unto them that are sent by him for the punishment of evildoers and for the praise of them that do well. Government's responsibility is the punishment of evildoers and the praise of those that are doing well. Paul would put in Romans 13, verses 3 and verse 4, for rulers are not a terror to good works, but to the evil. Wilt thou then not be afraid of the power? That power there is governmental authority. Do that which is good, and thou shalt have the praise of the saint. For he is the minister of God to thee for good. But if thou do that which is evil, be afraid. For he beareth not the sword in vain. He is a minister of God, a revenger to execute wrath upon him that doeth evil. Peter very put, uh, puts it a little simpler. Punishment of evildoers, praise of those that do well. Paul says ex exactly the same thing. They are to praise those that do good. They are to punish those who do evil. And he is the minister of God to execute wrath upon those who do evil. That includes the death penalty. I know a lot of people don't like the death penalty. I'll put it, I don't like the death penalty as executed in the United States today. But the Bible authorizes, yea, demands government to put to death certain individuals. There that we just read in Romans 13 and verse 4, that he is a minister, government is a minister of God to thee for good, but if thou do evil, 
be afraid, for he beareth not the sword in vain. For he is a minister of God, a revenger, to execute wrath upon him that doeth evil. He bears not the sword in vain. The sword was an instrument of death, putting someone to death. And he's saying the government has that responsibility to, yes, praise those who do good, but those who do evil, he is, has a responsibility to execute those individuals who are evildoers. In Genesis, the ninth chapter, <clears throat> and verse 4, God sets forth a principle for all time <clears throat> that whosoever sheddeth man's blood, by man shall his blood be shed. For in the image of God made he man. God expects government to fulfill this which he has set forth here. He expects government to punish the evildoer. I was listening to a video this morning. Couldn't even finish it. Got so sickening, sickening of it. Because he was attacking those individuals, for example, who are pro-life. Well, didn't God kill all the world in the flood? had no concept of biblical principles. God executed those individuals during the days of the flood because every thought of man's imagination was only evil continually. And so God executed the death penalty upon the, that world, yes. God expects the government now to execute the death penalty upon those who be, do evil. But we've got far too many who are just so pious. Oh, we can't have the death penalty. We can't put somebody to death. Well, it's a government's obligation. And now then, we, it's getting to the point that a lot of people just can't even put them in jail. The riots of a few years ago. Most of those rioters, evildoers, going in and stealing and robbing, destroying businesses, nothing was done to them. Absolutely nothing. And then you have a set of judges that have been placed in positions of authority that basically there was one set that said, it doesn't matter if they commit this crime, we're not going to prosecute them. Then why not go out and commit that crime? Not going to be prosecuted, that's what the prosecutor said, and the judges said. And they started letting them out of jail simply because, well, they wanted to. Because they were soft on crime. And know where those places, have those judges have taken over and that type of an attitude has taken over? Crime has soared. And we're surprised why? Government's responsibility is to, to punish those who do evil. And when they fail to punish those who do evil, then society as a whole is going to be destroyed. We need to get back to the principles of what God has set forth. Yes, government punishing the evildoer, praising those who do well, and in that punishment of the evildoer, if the need be, there is the execution of those individuals. And that execution being done speedily. And yes, I will. Somebody's going to say, "Oh well, but what if there is a mistake made?" There might be, but that does not alleviate the government's responsibility for the action. <clears throat> 
Should you take every precaution and mistakes are not made? Well, certainly. But you still fulfill the responsibility that God has given to government. And that includes those who do well praising them. Pious softness never works. Whether it be in the home or whether it be in government, or Lord willing, next week we're going to see the failure of it in the church. God is not going to be soft in that way either. He says, you obey me, you'll hear those words, well done, thou good and faithful servant, enter in the joys of thy Lord. He praises those who do well. Those who do not obey him, Christ is going to come in flaming fire, taking vengeance upon them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, and they're going to be punished with an everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power, 2 Corinthians 1, verse 6 through verse, 10, through verse 9. The praise of those who do evil, yes, or do well, yes, praise of them, heaven's home. But those who do evil, those who do not obey the gospel, then an everlasting punishment and hell fire. God is not going to be soft in that way. He extends his grace to all people today. For by the grace of God you're saved that God's grace is extended to each and every person. But we as individuals must be acceptive of that grace and obey that teaching that he has set forth in obedience to the gospel of Jesus Christ through our faith that Christ died for our sins. Repenting of those sins, turning away from that evil to turn to God in God's way being baptized in water for the forgiveness of our sins, and in, this, in that, having the sins washed away by Christ's blood, and then living the type of life that God would have us to live, godliness and holiness, putting on the Christian graces, the fruit of the Spirit, having that demonstration of love as set forth in 1 Corinthians 13, 4 through 8. If you've not obeyed that gospel of Jesus Christ, don't suffer the wrath of God. Accept his saving grace and be saved by the blood of Jesus Christ in that act of baptism. If you've obeyed that gospel, but you haven't continued in faithfulness to God and you've gone back into the ways of the world, repent of your sins. Let us pray with you for the forgiveness of them so that you can enjoy the blessings that God will bestow upon his children. If you need to come, do so as we stand and sing the invitation song.